Well, good morning, church. It is good to see you all. We are glad that you're here this morning. We're going to start things off here in a moment and uh, see what our God's got in store for us today. It's awesome because we know whatever it is, it's going to be good. And uh, so it is so good to be here together with you. I missed you all last week. It looks like you had a fantastic outdoor service last week with perfect weather and uh, lots of good things happening. So I'm glad that you did. It is good to be home. And um, you can meet me offline if you want an update on where I was and what I was doing and how it went. Um, but we had, a, we had a good time. I was on a, on a trip to Eastern Europe. Uh, with my ministry band, uh, Country Boys, who many of you know about and support. And so we, uh, we thank you for your prayers while we were gone. I'll give you the short version. The important information you need to know is we saw over 2,000 decisions for Christ. And, uh, man, it was a beautiful thing. So we thank you for supporting me through that. And uh, we're going to pray. And uh, that, was that, that was last week and the week before, and now this is today, and God has something new for us today. So let's pray, and let's see what that is. God, we thank you for this day. Uh, God, we do thank you for the fact that you are at work in this world. God, we thank you that um, both overseas and here, we saw people coming to Christ, uh, even within the past week. Father, we love you, and we want the world to know you. God, we just pray that you would be with us today. Speak to hearts here. God, we are here to worship you. We are here to, uh, to seek you, God, and to follow you. So just be with us through everything that we do. Let our worship uh, just rise to you. Uh, God, let us just fall humbled before you. <coughs> Speak to our hearts. God, change lives in this place today. We love you. And we pray it in your precious name. Amen. All right. Well, let's lift our voices. Let's lift our hearts. Let's come and let's worship the King of Kings together this morning. All right? One, two, three. Yeah, we're clearing off the surface You're coming into focus We're going back to the basics The glory of your face is the reason why we do this The winds of worship blowing Yeah, the doors of heaven open Jesus, you're at the center, Lord, help us to remember the reason why we do this. And it's all about you, yes, it's all about you, always has been, always will be all about you, all about you. Our priorities are changing Yeah, we remember why you made us Yeah, we're all sons and daughters Just dancing with our Father It's not that complicated And it's all about you Yes, it's all Yeah. 
Every story of impossible miracles It's all about you Every story of a prodigal coming home It's all about you Every story of revival I know It's all about you Your kingdom's all about Life's changed empty graves It's all about you Every story of impossible miracles It's all about you
It's up to us to remember to look for it, to find it, to see it, to appreciate it. As we continue worshiping this morning, we'll celebrate not only the fact that he's always there, but the fact that there is power in his name and power when we recognize that he is all around us all the time and power when we speak his name. Let's lift him up. Jesus. 
Thank you, Ray. If you don't recognize that man, that's my friend, Trey's friend, Ray Ramirez, visiting us from out of town. We're so glad to have him. It is so good to worship together with you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the fact that you are holy forever, God, that you are with us forever, and that there is power in the name of Jesus. God, we just ask that you would speak to hearts here today. God, remind us of all of those things. God, speak to hearts here. Send us away from this place today, knowing that you are in our lives, knowing that you are all around us, and knowing that we can claim power in the name of Jesus, that we can claim victory and overcome in the name of Jesus. God, we love you. God, we are here for you. Draw us close. We pray it in your name. Amen. Amen, amen. We do welcome you. You may be seated. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks to Kevin. He's back from Ukraine in one piece, and we're very glad to see him. We do thank Ray Ramirez, our friend from King of Kings, for being with us today. It is always an honor to be with our friends, and it's our honor to be with you today and worship you, those in the room and those watching online. It's our honor to sing praises to the Lord and to study his word together. And we are inside today, as you can see, but I hope you were able to join us last Sunday morning as we sat outside and celebrated the 140th birthday of our church. It was a wonderful day of celebration and praise to the Lord. And our desire, as we talked about last Sunday, is to be a bridge, to be a bridge from the past to the future and from people to Jesus. As we begin year number 141 in the life of this congregation, we want to be the place where people can connect with the Savior. And so we are honored to celebrate the church's birthday last week, and now we keep moving forward in ministry. We do that today. We offer, as we do each week, if you would allow us to pray with you and pray for you, we would love to do that. At the end of our service, we will have members of our prayer team right here at the front of the stage. They would love to pray with you personally if you would like that. Also, we have a prayer room that's right outside this door. You might choose to visit that. And also, if you have a worship guide today... There's a little tear-off section. You might want to write a prayer need on this tear-off slip that you can drop in one of the offering boxes, or you can use the email address, especially if you're watching online, prayer at firstmelissa.com. We have a busy week ahead. We've got Celebrate Recovery Ministries on Monday evenings. We've got Torah Tuesday on Tuesday evenings. We began our new reading cycle from the book of Genesis this past Tuesday it's a great time to jump into a weekly study of the Word. Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. We're starting with the book of Genesis, of course, and we'd love to have you join us right here in this room. Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Our Wednesday evening ministries are at 6.30 p.m. We've got multiple different Bible study options for adults. We've got great things for our teenagers. In fact, this Wednesday for our student ministry, they have a special event coming up that they are calling Rodeo Fest this Wednesday, 5.30. You're invited to be a part of that. So the teenagers will have a big thing. The kids have a big fun thing planned for them and in our kids' ministry as well. So 5.30 p.m. begins dinner. 6.30 p.m. begins our adult Bible study classes, and you are invited to jump in. Also, this, Mon uh, this Friday morning is what's known as MomCo, a ministry to moms. And so if you're a mom with a youngster, you're invited to come. And if you're able to be a volunteer to help with the kids' ministry on that day, you can talk to our folks with our kids' ministry. But that is coming up this Friday morning. And today you will see another table in the foyer as you have for the past several weeks. We told you that in a few weeks it will be time to adopt families for our Christmas Angels ministry. But so far we've been in the session of nominating families who might need our help this Christmas season. And so today is the last day to nominate folks. If you know someone who might need an extra blessing this Christmas with their kids and with their family, then that's what the table is for. You can nominate a family today. We have a lot more ministry going on. Make sure you check the mobile app and your worship guide 
Also, I want to thank you for giving your tithes and offerings, giving to ministries, a way that we all do our part. We all work together to take the story of the gospel around the world. We give our tithes and offerings because God has given to us, and we can give in multiple ways. I mentioned the offering boxes are in this room. Some are in the hallways. If you prefer to give by cash or check, that's what those boxes are for. Many choose to give electronically. It's very simple. The website is firstmelissa.com slash give. So thank you for doing ministry with us in lots of ways, including with your giving. It's a season of the year. It's a season in our nation when all of America is talking about an election that's coming up. So because America is thinking about it and because America is talking about it, we need to think about it and we need to talk about it. So for the next several weeks, we're going to begin a teaching series this morning titled, In God We Trust. We're going to talk about voting and we're going to talk about elections, but more than that, we're going to talk about the God that we serve and the God who gives us his scripture to guide us. You've all heard the phrase, in God we trust, and you probably know that it is the official motto of the United States. There you see the $1 bill right there, in God we trust. It was adopted by the U.S. Congress in 1956 as our national motto. So it wasn't around in the time of the American Revolution. It's a relatively new decision by our nation to declare as our national motto, in God we trust. Now it became that in 1956 officially, but it had been around for a while. In fact, in the 1800s, it first appeared on coins, the two cent coin. It appeared on in 1864, 1873. The Congress passed an act where it would be printed on all new coins, but it didn't appear on paper money until after the 1956 law was passed. So it is our national motto to say, in God we trust. You see it on police cars. You see it on federal buildings. And it's the national motto of our nation. It's the national motto or the state motto for a, a number of states in our country as well. But it has to be a fact that's real in our lives. It can't be just a motto. So we're naming this series in God we trust and the questions have already come up. Why this series? Why now? Why do we need to talk about this as followers of Jesus? Well, politics can be handled positively or negatively. They can be handled with grace or with anger. And we need to learn how to deal with the world that we live in with grace. We don't trust human government for spiritual guidance. We don't now and we don't after the election. It doesn't matter who's in office. Politics cannot and will not save us. Only faith in the Savior brings salvation to people who desperately need a Savior. As followers of Jesus, we're called to be salt and light in a hurting world, and that's what we're going to learn about today. But also why this series? Because followers of Jesus want advice and want encouragement. I imagine you've gotten all kinds of advice as a follower of Jesus. Living in a season, in a culture, you can't ignore the fact that we're in an election season. That we're voting for who our president, who our senators and congress members and state representatives will be. You can't ignore the situation so many followers of Jesus want advice. They want encouragement. How do I honor God in this season? So for the next several weeks, this will be our series, In God We Trust. And you may be asking, who is this series for? And this is for followers of Jesus who love politics. And we have some in our congregation. This is for followers of Jesus who hate politics. And we have some of those in our congregation as well. We have this series for followers of Jesus who are involved in politics, and we have some who have, are holding elected office right now or help on campaigns or help as uh, poll watchers and things like that. We have people who are involved, and we have followers of Jesus in our congregation who ignore politics and wish it didn't exist and wish all the commercials would stop. 
Mostly this is for followers of Jesus who want to understand God's word regarding these matters. God has designed government. It was his invention. And we as followers of Jesus need to understand the scriptures. But we also need to understand the relative importance of politics. Remember, please, that for believers in Jesus, their ultimate allegiance must be to God above all other people and above our nation. You know probably that I served in the U.S. Army. I wore the uniform of this country. Many of you did as well. But my allegiance is to King Jesus before it is to the United States of America. And my allegiance is to King Jesus before it is to President X or Y or Z. And our allegiance must be in that priority order. Devotion to the Savior motivates Christians to participate in the decisions of government and influence society toward righteousness because believers understand the expectations God has for his people. All political candidates are flawed, sinful people who seek office to influence governmental processes and priorities through legislation and negotiation. They are not spiritual leaders, and they are not the savior of mankind, and they are not the savior of society. And despite the importance of participating in the governing process, political activity and legislative involvement must remain secondary to the growth of our personal relationship with Jesus, and our highest priority, our ultimate aim must remain telling the story of Jesus, evangelism and discipleship. This is how you understand its relative importance. It's important. It's what our world is facing. It's what our country is talking about right now, but it's not more important than our walk with Jesus. So if you look at politics and you say this is messy and this is ugly, and this is godless, and you ask, where is God in politics? I need to remind you that God is the creator of heaven and earth. He's neither a Republican nor a Democrat. And Christian citizens ought to choose their candidates based on their adherence to biblical principles rather than their political party affiliations. You don't Vote as a follower of Jesus for an R or a D or an I or an L. You vote for people who say they best align with Christian values. Tony Campolo, a pastor and a writer, has this quote for us. God stands above all political parties and calls each of them, back up please, into judgment. Likewise, he calls upon us to rise above all of this and he expects us to use the scriptures as a touchstone to test whether the policies and practices of political parties are in harmony with his will. And we have another quote from Tony Campolo. There is no better way for a political party to establish legitimacy of its political point of view than to declare that Jesus is one of its members. This remaking of Jesus is not just some kind of harmless campaign technique. It is not merely something sophisticated sociological observers can pass off with a wry smile and a wave of the hand. It is not just bad religion that needs correcting. The Bible calls it idolatry. So if party A or party B calls themselves the party of Jesus, they're wrong. You say, well, what party stands closer with Jesus? That's for you to decide. But neither one of them are the party of Jesus. This form of idolatry offends God and places the desires of man above the holy and perfect character of our Lord. And maybe we would like to have a president like President Abraham Lincoln who said, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My great concern is to be on God's side. May you give us a president like that, please, God. So why be informed? Why get involved? Because to fail to participate is to forfeit the right to shape the moral future of America. We have a voice and it's called the vote. We have a voice called participation. And if we forfeit that right, we forfeit our voice. 
Why get involved? Because those who profess no faith in Christ will continue to dominate the political process until influential and dedicated Christians enter the political arena. And rather than thinking that government and religion are to be separate and distinct, we ought to take our biblical principles into politics to change governments for the better through voting and seeking elective office. But please, please hear me. As much as this is all over our media, it's all over our social media, it's in your family conversations, please remember we must watch our priorities. To honor God in the political arena, one must be involved to serve others, the next slide, and to serve God. Not for financial gain, not to assert power over others. Go to the next slide. As believers, we are primarily concerned about eternal matters, not temporal ones. Because as the book of Acts chapter 4 says, there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved other than the name of Yeshua, the name of Jesus. So we're going to talk about the importance of voting and the importance of being involved and the importance of making your voice heard. But please, please watch our priorities. That none of that is more important than telling the gospel story. Telling the story of salvation. So here's the question of the moment. What do we do first? 1 Timothy chapter 2 the Apostle Paul says, first of all, first of all, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. The Apostle Paul says, first thing you do is pray. And here's how we wrote it. If we are praying for our leaders, we won't have the time or the desire to adore them or hate them or ridicule them or ignore them because we're busy praying for them. So before we go any further today, let's pray. Would you bow with me right now? Our God, we confess to you that we are tempted to get our priorities wrong. Please help us who know and follow after Jesus to keep him as our priority. And honoring our Savior and proclaiming our Savior, may that, Lord, be our priority. And God, as our nation faces an election, we know you will raise up a new leader. We pray for Mr. Trump or Mrs. Harris. We pray for our next president that they would seek you, that they would honor you, that they would humble themselves before you, that they would seek wisdom and counsel from those who know God and know the word of God. And Father, every president, every politician is a flawed sinner who needs a Savior. And we pray that every one of them would call upon you for salvation. And God, may we who proclaim the name of Jesus, may we commit today and moving forward to pray for our leaders. Not to adore them or hate them. Not to ridicule them or ignore them but to pray for them that they would seek you. May this become our commitment. And I pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. So let's go to the scriptures. Please find your way with me to the book of Matthew chapter 5. It might be a familiar story to you from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is speaking to his audience. 
not specifically about politics. He's talking about things that are of higher priority and greater importance than politics. He's talking about how to live a life of faith, how to live a life that honors the Savior. So we're going to read part of the Sermon on the Mount, which covers Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. We're going to read chapter 5, a few verses, verses 13 through 16. And it begins in Matthew 5, verse 13. Jesus is speaking and he says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Jesus is speaking to a large crowd. The Gospel of Matthew says there was a multitude in the audience. We don't know how many people that is. Hundreds or thousands. There was a multitude. And he says, as it's written down in the Greek, you are the salt of the earth. For you grammarians, second person plural. For the Texans, remember, all y'all. He's not speaking to one of you or one of you individually. He says, all y'all. You are the salt of the earth. If you are my follower, if you are my believer, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. So Jesus is going to give us two assignments in this passage, two descriptions that ought to characterize his followers, and the first one is salt. Now remember, Jesus was the master storyteller, and he spoke about things that his audience could relate to. Jesus never spoke about football. He never spoke about baseball. He never spoke about space travel or computers because it was completely unknown to his audience. He spoke about things his audience as first century Jews in the land of Israel could easily relate to. And here he's going to use the example of salt. And he says to his followers, you are the salt of the earth. Now, why would he use that? What are the qualities of salt? Well, first you need to know that the word salt is related to the word salary. And the word salary in English comes through various languages, starting in Latin, salarium, which means salary, root word sal, which is our word for salt. Why? Because in ancient Rome, in the days of Jesus, in the days of the Gospels, The Roman Empire, the soldiers, were paid money so they could ensure they had salt. And sometimes they weren't even paid money. They were paid their paycheck in salt. You've now figured out why your grandmother used to say he's not worth his salt. Because this is where this phrase comes from. So salt was valuable. Salt was something that was important. It was influential. It was desirable. It was helpful. Salt is also something that adds flavor. Why do you put it on your food? It adds flavor. We have some quotes here. Salt permanently changes the flavor of food just as the influence of godly people can change a culture. Colossians chapter 4, Apostle Paul says, Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of your opportunity. Let your speech always be seasoned with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. How much salt do you put on your food? Well, it depends on what's needed. How much grace do you participate or, or, or include in your conversation? As much as is needed. Sometimes it's a little and sometimes it's a lot. Let your speech be seasoned with grace like you season with salt. Salt adds flavor. Also, number three here, it preserves against decay. I know you understand that until relatively recently in human history, you don't have to go back very many decades to when our houses didn't have electricity and didn't have a refrigerator and the only way you could preserve food, especially meat, from spoiling was to add salt. 
It prevents decay. So it's to spice it up, but it's also to prevent it from corrupting and spoiling. The followers of Jesus, we're to be involved in culture, to try to prevent or to slow down the decay of our society, the rotting of our values. We are to be salt. And also, number four, salt, as you know, creates thirst. Makes you want to drink. Jesus' followers, the quote says, would be like salt in that they would create a thirst for greater information. When one sees a unique person who possesses superior qualities in specific areas, he desires to discover why that person is different. We want people to be thirsty, not for a political party or a candidate. We want people to be thirsty for the gospel. And the thing that makes them thirsty is when they see someone who professes to follow Jesus, but they have a peace that passes all understanding. They have a hope that's bigger than the election results. They have a strength that's greater than human strength. We want people to be thirsty for the gospel, and that's what salt does. So, question. What characteristics of Christ's followers would make non-believers thirsty for the gospel? Grace, faith, honesty, peace, hope, love, and humility. What characteristic of Christ's followers would not make non-believers thirsty for the gospel? The candidate or the party they supported in an election. If you want to make people thirsty for the gospel, tell them about Jesus, not who you voted for. Tell them about the grace and the love of the Savior. So we would be known more for the former than the latter. Jesus said we're to be salt. Salt in this culture. Well, the question is what happens if the salt stops being salty? What happens if believers become less salty and more earthy? This is a verse where Jesus pretty much says it straight, Luke 14. Jesus said, salt is good, but if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. You would put salt on the soil. This was their ancient way to kill the weeds. Because salt, when you pour it, kills the plant. And you would pour it on your compost pile because it aids in the fertilization and the fermentation process. But if your salt isn't salty, it's not even good enough for that. And then he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus says, pay attention. Pay attention to what you can bring to society as one of my followers. So in verse 13, Jesus said to all y'all, you are the salt of the earth. And then in verse 14, he says to all y'all, you are the light of the world. Again, second person plural. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket or put it under a bowl. But you put it on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. If you want to have a candle or a torch and the first century, no electricity, and you want to give light to your house, you don't take your candle and put a bowl on top of it. That's defeating the purpose. You put it up on the mantle. You put it on the lampstand. You put it in a prominent place where it can be seen so it gives light to all who are in the house. Jesus told his followers to be salt, and now he's telling his followers to be light, but he says to be light in a way that is visible. We went through the qualities of salt. Now, how about the qualities of light? The first one is to be visible, to be involved, to be out in the public conversation. Light is visible. Light cannot be ignored. The smallest little light that you have in your house, when you go to to bed at night and you 
have all the lights off in the house and you see those little lights everywhere on your smoke alarm and on your oven and you see all these little bitty tiny lights. In the middle of the day, you completely ignore them. But when it's dark, you notice all of them because light cannot be ignored. Light shows the way. You see all the exit signs in this room. If the power goes out, this is the way that shows you the exit. And light brings peace and security because you know you're not lost. You know you're not in danger because it shows you the way. And even the smallest little bit of light combats the darkness. So when Jesus calls his followers to be salt and to be light, he tells us in verse 16 our assignment. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And if you needed to pick one verse forever to think about when it comes to elections, when it comes to politics, when it comes to being involved in the culture of our nation, if you needed to pick one verse, I think Jesus might say, this is the one. Because each word and each phrase Spoken by the Savior carries weight. It gives guidance to us. It's not fluff. It's not extraneous. Every single word matters. Jesus said, first of all, let your light, your. Remember second person plural? All y'all, all of us. There's power in multiple lights shining together. See, we could have one single light pointing down to this stage. Instead, we have 30 lights pointing down at this stage. There's power in multiples. Do this as a family. Do this as a congregation. Let your light shine before men. Do it together. And then he says, let your light shine. We'll realize the light that we're talking about It's not our light. We're to be the mirror that reflects the light. John 8, verse 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. See, the light that we are to display, it's not even us. It's Jesus. I'm sure you understand your sixth grade science class. There's a huge burning, flaming object in the sky that we call the sun. And then there's another object called the moon. And every night you see the moon light up. But remember, the moon has no light. Scientifically, there is no light that comes from the moon. It simply does what? It reflects the sun. When we're called by the Savior to let our light shine, it's him It's proclaiming him that he is our priority, that he is our focus. Let your light shine. See, that's the question about how well do we reflect it. Can you see Jesus in me? In my private life, in my family life, my personal friendships, in the public arena, am I reflecting the light of Jesus? Is it shining? And this is shining before men. We've talked a lot, especially in the Bridge series, about going public with our faith. To live what we believe, but also to speak what we believe. To live in an honest way or generous or kind or patient or gracious way. We should live that. It should be our actions, but it also has to be our words. Your light, my light cannot shine before men if we never share it with anybody else. May we be known more for our consistent walk with Jesus than for our favorite politician or party or social issue. May our light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works. See, the faith, the change in my heart affects my thoughts 
which affects my words, and then it affects my actions. So the light that I have that's not me, that's Jesus, the light that I have that I'm supposed to reflect well, shine well, in a public way before people, my neighbors, my coworkers, my schoolmates, I'm supposed to do this publicly and not just say things, but do things and do things for those who are hurting in such a way that they may see your good works. Guess what? They cannot see my good works if I don't have any good works. What good works has God called you to do? Who is in your circle that's hurting, that needs help, that needs encouragement? And the next verb there, and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You've been around the church world for a while. You've heard of a song called the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings. Okay, that's, that's as much singing as you'll get today. Okay. The doxology is from the Greek verb doxazo. To praise, to magnify, to celebrate. That's what this word is, to glorify. Glorify your father. The verb is to celebrate. So the question is, who are we praising and celebrating in this election season? And who will we be praising and celebrating the day after the election? It ought to be King Jesus today and it ought to be King Jesus the day after the election. Glorify, lift up his name. Vote for a candidate, you should. But you don't glorify a candidate. Vote for a specific issue that's important to you that matches your biblical values, but you don't glorify an issue. You glorify who? Your Father who is in heaven. That's the last phrase. So if people looked at us honestly, would they know if we're seeking to glorify ourselves or a candidate or a political party or would they think we're glorifying the Father in heaven? And we better ask ourselves the bottom two questions. So what words and actions glorify the Father and what words and actions do not glorify the Father? Because there are things you can say in the political arena that make a difference for God's kingdom, that honor him. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can say in the political arena that doesn't glorify God. So, watch ourselves. What glorifies our Father who is in heaven? Because we're trying to be spiritual people in a very practical world. So please remember, our political leaders are found in Washington, D.C. and in Austin the capital of our nation, the capital of our state. Our laws are made in Washington and in Austin. But our salvation is not found in Washington or in Austin. Our hope is not found in Washington or Austin. Our purpose in life is not found in Washington and Austin because our Savior is greater than those in Washington and Austin. So what can believers do in the political arena? What can we do? What should we do? Here's what I believe God's word says could be our homework assignment. We already read, first of all, pray for your leaders in your community. Pray. Number two, be informed about the issues. You can't have a voice about an issue if you don't understand what's going on. Be involved. Let your voice be heard. Call elected officials. Send emails. Make appointments. Go see them. Go talk to them. Vote for candidates who best express biblical values. Hear me. You're not going to vote for a candidate to be your savior because none of them can be. So you vote for candidates who best express biblical values. And then as I've talked about before, run for office if God leads you. If you say nobody out there is doing it for the glory of God, then you run. 
And as we've learned today in Matthew 5, live as the salt of Jesus, making people thirsty for him. And live as the light of Jesus, bringing glory to the Father. This is our homework assignment. And when I talk to you about this, to say, you need to know what's going on and you need to pray and you need to be involved. Please understand, here we are in the year 2024, about to vote for a president. But this isn't something new. To take you in the time machine, look at this. This is Dallas Morning News 2006. The same thing. Know what God has called you to understand and to believe and then vote that way. But you're not voting for a savior. You're voting for a politician and you're going to pray that that politician follows the savior. So we're going to finish with a couple quotes. Here's a brilliant thought from John Ortberg. The longing is for a carpenter turned rabbi who once ran for Messiah and got crucified. So we read about the issues, we debate, we learn about policy, we pray, we speak respectfully in the public square, we vote at elections, we serve on councils and cabinets, we preach about God's concern for peace and justice and generosity and righteousness but we always remember this is something we do while we're waiting. Because somebody is going to take office in January in Washington and we're going to wait for that leader to take a position. But more important than that, we are waiting for the Savior to come back. And we do all this while we're waiting for him. So two final questions. If America had an election and one or more of the candidates for an office outwardly demonstrated devotion to Jesus and knowledge of the Bible, what should Christ's followers do? In God we trust. And if America held an election and none of the candidates for an office outwardly demonstrated devotion to Jesus and knowledge of the Bible, what should Christ's followers do? In God we trust. So I'm going to finish with you reading with me here Psalm 40, verse 4. How blessed is the man who has made Yahweh his trust and has not turned to the proud nor to those who lapse into falsehood. Now, I don't know if you've ever watched a political speech at any level of government, but I imagine the words proud and falsehood could be used to describe some of those speeches. See, not only do we say in God we trust, we say in only God we trust. How blessed is the man who has made Yahweh his trust, not turn to the proud or to those who lapse into falsehood. Voting has started across America, started in Texas. Maybe you voted already, maybe you have not. If you have not, you should. Vote for the candidates at every level of government who you believe best express biblical values, but don't think we're voting for a savior. We're giving our hearts to a savior and we're voting for a candidate and those aren't the same thing. Why? In only God we trust. Would you pray with me? As we bow, I'm gonna ask a couple of our prayer team folks to be right here. They're gonna pray with you personally afterward if you'd like. Father, we bow before you and we say openly, we say outwardly in only you do we trust. Father, we pray that you would guide followers of Jesus across this country to vote for candidates at every level who best express biblical values. But we don't dare think that our salvation comes from a person in a political office. Our salvation comes when we confess our sin and give our hearts to the sinless Savior of the world who is not a president or a governor or a senator. He is the king of all kings. 
and only in Jesus do we trust. Father, may we glorify your name in this season of our country. May our light shine for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you for coming. Blessings today.